We're going to turn our Bible back again tonight to Revelation chapter number 2. And in our series of study on the seven sevens in the Revelation and dealing tonight again on the sevenfold prescribed, well, the prescribed, uh, let me get it right here, account of the seven churches. And previously we've answered to Revelation 1, 19 about the things that that John has seen covering the sevenfold presented vision of the glorified Christ. That's Revelation chapter 1. And now we're in our study tonight dealing with the sevenfold prescribed account of the seven churches. And Sister Bonnie, I'll give you one of these before I forget it because I, I may forget it at the end of the service. This is what we've been studying in Sunday school. And you and Brother Don can have that to read after. But anyway, we're going to study tonight on this second church that is listed in the list of seven churches. And we're going to study about the church of Smyrna. And I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to breathe upon us really the briefest, the shortest message in all the seven is the church to Smyrna. And we're going to just deal with this and maybe get into the church of Pergamos just a little bit to kind of get started for the next lesson. The Lord will we'll have to see how, it, how this lesson uh, plays out for the message tonight. Father, we come to thank you, Lord, for these good old songs that have blessed our heart on this evening. Lord, we've come into this place and we've called upon you. Thank you, Lord for the access that we have into the throne room of your grace. Lord, our worship of praying and talking to you. And then our worship of giving and the worship of praise. Lord, singing these songs and Lord, giving the fruit of our lips and giving praise to you. And now, Lord, we've come to this part of our worship service where we let your word speak to us. And I do pray as each one of these churches have ended up you said, let him that hath a year hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And Lord, I pray you'll help us now as an individual believer and as a corporate body of the church. Lord, let us have a heart tonight that's ready to receive your word and let the Spirit of God put these lessons in a practical and personal sense to our heart. And use the messages for your honor and your glory. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now I'm reading Revelation chapter number 2 and verse 8 down through verse 11. And John the Apostle, writing under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, this apostle that wrote the Gospel of John, that wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then here exiled on that lonely island of Patmos by Domitian, the Roman emperor, and thought they got rid of John, but he's out there for the testimony of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And what, what a book, I'm telling you, this book, the Revelation, that is pinned down by the Spirit of God. John is the seer, and he's seeing in the Spirit what's all in reality that we'll see in days to come in fulfillment of on in the Revelation. But in Revelation 2 and verse 8, and unto the angel, that's the messenger, of the church in Smyrna, right. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison 
that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath a ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So that's reading this prescribed account with the church at Smyrna. The second in the list of seven churches in Asia Minor. And so we're going to give this account for somewhat in answer to Revelation 119, the things which are. That's what John's writing about these seven Pacific churches. And we see the church at Smyrna existing in John's day and in a Pacific area of the persecuted we call it the persecuted era. The status of this church was the suffering church. A whole lot different than the church at Ephesus, which existed in the post-apostolic era. But here's a church, the suffering church, I must say. And the Lord's going to approach this church much like he did the church at Ephesus without the condemnation. He condemned or he he, he had some, some things against the church of uh, Ephesus because they had left their first love. This church was a spiritually cold church. But not so with the church at Smyrna. He had no words whatsoever. Had no complaints whatsoever with this church at Smyrna. And I'm favored to believe that it had a whole lot to do with this city that still in a constant, continual existence. By the way, of course, Ephesus is uh, just laying there in ruins with the theater and the amphitheater and, and even the library at Ephesus, and a lot of it is just laying there in ruins, but not so much to say with the church at Smyrna. Smyrna sitting there in Izmir, Turkey. That's where it's at. And they have a harbor, and they have the theaters and the temples and, and a whole lot of other things that in John's day. But anyway, they call it the crown of Asia. And we studied a little bit historically with the church at Ephesus, the city uh, known for its uh, vanity fair and the goddess uh, temple of Diana, which they were carrying on with their abominable uh, orgies and all that around that old uh, godless temple. But in Izmir, Turkey, at, at the church at Smyrna existing, and uh, I must say, a beautiful city with flowers. And they have what they call most of them places, and especially in Israel, they have the high place, and all them towns. And of course, in Turkey, with the church at Smyrna, they have the high place. We call it the Acropolis. And of course, in Athens, Greece, you can go halfway up the Acropolis the high place in Athens, and the Mars Hill sits there, then on up to the Athenian temple, which which looks all, all over the city of Athens. But here in Izmir, Turkey, they had the harbor and this beautiful, uh, upon the Acropolis of the high place, they had this encircled place with all kinds of flowers. And really, we, we got to see that when we was there somewhat, and, and of course, the flowers wasn't there, but anyway, that they call it the crown of Asia there in Izmir, Turkey. Some little bit about the city of Izmir, Turkey, where this church existed at. But anyway, looking at the church, and it gets its name from the word mirth, which is associated with the dead. And of course, the wise men bringing their gifts at Christ's birth, frankincense and mirth, and of course was looking down prophetically to the day that Christ would die. But this church gets its name and the suffering church from the word mirth, associated with the dead and associated with bitterness and suffering. And we're going to see some of the awful persecutions and persecutors during this time with the church at Smyrna. And we see the Lord now as we look down at this approach 
of our Lord Jesus. The Lord approaching this church as well as the other six churches given a characteristic of himself as to who he is and fitting for each one of the churches. In Ephesus, the spiritually cold church and our Lord approached this church as the one that was holding the seven stars that the messengers or the pastor who was walking up and down a mist in the midst of the seven golden churches making judgment of the church at Ephesus. But here's our Lord Jesus now in Revelation chapter 2 verse 8. And here his character is right here proclaimed when he said these things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. And that must be fitting and to a comfort to those that were suffering in John's day with the church at Smyrna. Looking back at Revelation chapter 1 verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, he said, Grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And all oh, John's given us a unique detail in introducing, introducing the revelation, given these characteristics of the glorified Christ. His pre-existence and his eternity or eternality is all right here in these verses I'm reading tonight. Revelation 1:17. John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And John said, Amen, and have the keys of hell and death. And so the Lord is coming now given a characteristic of himself and approaching the church at Smyrna or approaching this church all con concerned and given comfort to those that will suffer during this period of time. He said, I'm the first and the last before anything well he's always been and after him there he'll be the one in existence amen which was dead and is alive oh thank God our Lord Jesus that come on the scene in his awful death on the cross and no doubt the devil said I've got him now but thank God three on the third and appointed day Christ arises from among the dead as the first fruits of them that slept and I'm convinced he shook the keys in Satan's face and said I am he that liveth and was dead and is alive forevermore amen and have the keys of hell and death and so we see the church at Smyrna all oh, the persecuted church in the book the book of Fox the book of martyrs I, I hope maybe some of you have read some of it or have a co I have a copy of it at home and history through the Fox's book of martyrs says that five million were martyred in this era of the church at Smyrna five mi million people give their, their, their faith and I'll tell you and I'll tell you, not until death, but unto death, all the way up to death. And they would not denounce their faith, their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here is this church we call the persecuted and suffering church. And as I've just said, we see the character of the one who's sending this message, none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at verse 9 tonight, and we see his compliment and his words of commendation. And he did that with the church at Ephesus. And here he's going to compliment them. Here he's going he's gonna to commend them. And here's what he's commended them for. He said, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. 
And the Lord always has a word of commendation for those that are saved and that are at works that are coming after you're saved. Amen. Oh, that's just fitting. I said on the last lesson from Ephesians chapter 2, Paul said in Ephesians 2 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith. Grace is a gift of God and faith is a gift of God. No, I tell you, man ain't going to wander and want, uh, he's not going to worm himself. He's not going to work himself into salvation. No, it's God's grace that brings salvation. God come unto us as undeserving as we were and, and had nothing to bring to God. But he came to us when we could not come to him, when we had nothing that we could pay nothing that we could do that would satisfy a holy demand of a thrice holy God but he come to us in grace and he give us faith God had to grant the faith oh yes uh, repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus faith and grace are gifts of God but he said for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself not of works lest any man should boast. The late, well, not the late, but Brother Ben Carper, uh, he's the grandson of the late Harold Sutler. And I've heard him say over and over and over, when God saved us, he took all the bragging rights away. I have nothing to brag about at all. No, we ain't done anything. The Lord's done it all. He done the work on the cross in redemption, and he done the work in our heart in redemption generation amen i say salvation is all the work of god but in philippians chapter 2 verse 12 and these verses are weighing heavy on my heart on this eve now that we're saved paul called on us in philippians 2 12 work out your own salvation with fear and trembling he said for it is god that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure and paul simply saying now that you're saved i want you to work this salvation out it's worked in in your heart by god's grace but i want you to work it out with fear and trembling for it is god that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure and the works are highly emphasized now that we're saved and the works will come into play at the judgment seat of christ i've often said and i repeat on this evening if you get to heaven it'll be an act of god's grace and the work that he did on the cross and the work he's done in our heart but if you get a reward at the judgment seat of christ there will be works be involved and we've studied that over and over in our lessons in past dealing with the judgment seat of christ paul said it this way in second corinthians chapter number five verse nine wherefore we labor that whether present or absent that we may be accepted of him amen and all we now that are say we've already been accepted in the christ ephesians 1 6 but he's talking about being accepted our works abiding the fire of god's judgment whether or not we'll get a reward or lose a reward and so the lord is commending these believers in the church at smyrna he said i know thy works and i'm glad he he's an omni he's an omniscient god he's all knowing hey man oh i tell you you'll not do anything without the knowledge of a sovereign god and he's taken record as brother billy sings that song my lord keeps a record amen and god's putting it down every time we show up for church and our hearts into it to honor the lord jesus and our hearts given to to take in his word god's got a record of that amen but every time we bull up and be stubborn and don't want to listen to the word and try to hinder god's man god's got that on record too and that'll come against us one of these days is sure when we when our life is read before us at the judgment seat of christ but he said i not only know your works but i know your 
tribulation. And oh, I'd, I'd like to stay here a long time tonight, but I see my time's just running away like a freight train tonight. But this tribulation, oh, I'm so glad tonight he's not talking about the tribulation that is coming. We've established that over and over unless our hearts have noted on this evening in all reality when we come to the church at Philadelphia. Another one of these of the two churches that are mentioned in the Revelation that are saved from tribulation. Oh, I'm telling you, the Lord said to the church at Philadelphia, and he said, because thou hast kept my word, I'll keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. And we're saved from the tribulation that is coming. But I grant you, we're not saved from tribulation now. No, absolutely not. And I tried to jot some of these verses down, and I really need to look at them. And before I bring the message to a close, and I may just have to continue on with this church on the next lesson. But I have several of these verses that have to do with tribulation now. And we are going through tribulations in the plural. But let's look at John chapter 16 and 33. And the Lord's talking to Smyrna. He said, I know your tribulation. But look what the Lord said to his disciples before he left them in John 16, 33. And I can probably quote this verse, but I just want to thumb over and look down at it tonight. But in John 16, 33, and he'd been telling them that he's going to go away. And he was telling them that they'd have persecutions and all their hearts were sad but he said here in John 16 33 these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace in the world ye shall have tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world and the Lord saying to people that are saved in the world you're going to have tribulation in the book of Acts chapter 14 and verse 22. And here's a verse that will go right along with my lesson tonight. But in Acts 14, 22, the, the Bible said, as Paul in his further ministry, his first missionary journey it must be, but Acts 14, 22, it said the confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And so tribulation is associated with God's people now. In this world, we're going to have tribulation. Paul said in Romans 5, 3, we glory in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience hope, and hopeth make not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which He has given unto us. And so I'm saying, we're saved from that tribulation that's out ahead, the wrath of God, but we're not saved from tribulation here. Oh, 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And to stand for God and right in this King James Bible. No, not everybody's going to like you. No, you're not going to be popular. You'll be probably uh, talked about and be called a fanatic and, and all this other stuff that people say. But oh, thank God. To know that the Lord told us to be patient in tribulation. And here's the God of all comfort and the Father of all mercies who, who comforts us in all our tribulation. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. And then he not only says, I know your works. And not only says, I know your tribulation. But he said, I know your poverty and I'm convinced in John's day here was this church and most of the people the poor working class of people just a poor class of people and I'm not saying down in the on on the on on the side streets where I'll tell you with a slum city but they were poor materially speaking and all them that come to know the Lord Jesus 
I, I'm convinced without any doubt, as much as I've read in Scripture and read secular history, I'm convinced that those that got saved that maybe were rich and had material possession when they got saved, oh, I tell you, they confiscated their possessions and they become poor in a, in a physical sense. But thank God the Lord said right here in parentheses, but thou are rich. Amen. And you may, I've said a lot of times, you may not have two nickels you can bump together to call your own, but if you're saved, you're rich in the Lord. Amen. You'll have all the wealth, spiritually speaking on this evening. First Peter 1 3, Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath who has, now let's just turn over that verse, and I'm not getting it all together, and we're going to get it together before I close tonight. But Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again, what unto? A living hope. That means a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And oh, I tell you, in John's day, here was this poor class of people. Even those that had got saved had been rich at one time, but oh, they become poor. And the Lord said, you're rich, amen. A whole lot different than the church at Laodicea. He said, you're, you're poor and you don't even know it. That's what he said to the Laodicean church. But the Lord said, you're rich. And he said, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And in John's day, here was a blasphemy. There was a lot of them Jews saying they were real Jews, and there were not. And John said, you're just simply of the synagogue of Satan. And that takes us to Romans chapter 9 and verse 6. And Paul is writing, to the Israel of God. There's the true Israel in Israel. Amen. There's the, there's the really the physical posterity of Abraham. But then with that, there's the spiritual posterity of Abraham. And that's where we Gentiles fit in on this eve. But in John's day, there was those that were just tried. They were not real Jews. They were of the sinny God of Satan. And all this thing, it, when the next church we're going to study about, we're seeing not only the sinny God of Satan, but Satan's seat and where Satan dwells. And Satan's, he's a big, I, I tell you, he's a big person in religion, I'm telling you. And that's how the devil reaches the masses of people. I was studying this afternoon in all the persecution and we'll not have time to get it in tonight but the next lesson we'll prepare for it the Lord will but in John's day there were ten persecutors all with ten we, we might say ten different persecutors that were persecuting against the church and had the list of them Domitian and of course uh, that was the one that exiled John on the Isle of Patmos and and on down the list, ten of them. But all oh, the devil had tried to exterminate the church by, by having them martyred. But he seen they couldn't do that. And so he began to work inwardly on the church. And that's where the church at Pergamos comes up. The church that had settled down in the world and mixed with religion and worldliness and that's where a lot of churches fit on the EC. A church existing in John's day that had settled down and mixed with the world and a church existing in our day. I must tell you that in a, in a application I must say but the Lord said here in verse 10 in closing tonight the Lord said fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation ten days be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown 
of life. And that's where we're going to really stop in our study tonight. But the Lord said, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. And all the Lord, in all essence, is coming right along with these people that were suffering. All he took knowledge of all them that went down in the record books of the Fox of Book, Book of Martyr. All them that were burned at the stake. Those that were thrown to the wild beast. And all the things that were done to kill these Christians. But all the Lord's got a record of it. And he said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And all oh, that's one of the five crowns that we've studied right here in this pulpit when we were dealing with the judgment seat of Christ. The crown of life that James said in, in James chapter 1 verse 12. Now let's just sum over there and then I promise we'll close right here tonight. James chapter 1 and verse 12. I was thinking about trying to close. Remember the late uh, J. Vern McGee, his wife, and say, you get up and say 15 minutes, I'm closing, and you're still going after 15 minutes. But anyway, we're looking at these verses. James chapter 1 verse 12 speaks of this crown of life. I call this the suffer's crown, but here it is. Blessed is a man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And the Lord told this church at Smyrna, we're going through all the persecution and affliction and the trials and the trouble. Their faith had been put to the test all the way to the max. They give their life unto the dead. And the Lord said, I've got a crown of life laid up for you and for all them that love him. Oh, that's the key. Loving him, not charging and condemning, not coming against God for what? Maybe a discomfort or an unfavorable situation in the way of suffering in our life. Just hold your head up and say, thank you, Lord. You're making it all work out for my good and for your ultimate glory. Well, we'll study a little bit further on the next lesson, the Lord willing, with the church at Smyrna. Father, we come to thank you on this God-given Sunday evening. Lord, you've let us sit here in the Morning Star Baptist Church and read about